A realidade é ampla, surpreendente, misteriosa, mas ao mesmo tempo apta de ser compreendida, nunca plenamente, é claro, mas cada vez mais profundamente. E apesar de ser muito diversa em seus itens, relações e mecanismos, ela apresenta sinais de ordem e de unidade. E é fundada nessa visão que nós, da Academia BC2, fundamos a revista Unos Mundos. Eu sou Marcelo Cabral, o host desse canal aqui de entrevistas, e tem sido uma grande alegria disponibilizar para o público brasileiro uma revista de alta cultura, como nós costumamos dizer, não acadêmica, mas academicamente informada, tocando em vários dos temas fundamentais da interseção entre a fé, as ciências e a filosofia. No, nosso, no site da Unos Mundos, você pode encontrar ensaios, artigos, colunas, entre vários outros meios de comunicação. E entre eles, nós temos este canal de entrevistas, a Entre Mundos, onde conversamos com grandes autores nacionais e internacionais. Essas entrevistas elas são disponibilizadas ao vivo, com vocês que estão aqui, mas sempre gravadas também e ficam no nosso canal do YouTube. Então aproveitem o nosso canal, aproveite para curtir esse vídeo, para se inscrever no nosso canal e assim você vai ficar a par de todos os conteúdos que a gente produz. Pessoal, é importante dizer que esta é a segunda entrevista que nós estamos conduzindo num novo modelo. É, o modelo é o seguinte, com convidados internacionais, toda a conversa é feita inteiramente em inglês. Nós percebemos que se perdia muito tempo e qualidade com aquele sistema de traduções, né? em que, é, e a gente pensou, com convidados tão especiais, com tanto conhecimento, nós precisamos de um formato para aproveitar ao máximo a conversa privilegiando a fluidez e a profundidade da discussão. Agora, fiquem tranquilos, porque esses vídeos serão legendados e depois serão disponibilizados no nosso canal com legenda em português. Então, para você que não entende totalmente o inglês ou quer enviar esse vídeo para outras pessoas, vai ver que essa entrevista vai ser maravilhosa, fique tranquilo, porque serão todos legendados. E hoje, especialmente, nós teremos o privilégio de conversar com um acadêmico brilhante, que tem uma história de vida um pouco heterodoxa em termos da sua relação com o mundo acadêmico, mas que tem uma produção fascinante na história das relações entre ciência e religião. Mais especificamente, ele investiga o grande período da Idade Média, um, um período tão longo, mas também tão mal compreendido, a importância dos seus desenvolvimentos, dos seus debates, da sua riqueza intelectual. E é com grande alegria que a gente vai conversar hoje com o doutor James Hannan. E então eu quero pedir para a Ana trazer todo mundo aqui para a nossa roda virtual de conversa. Olá, pessoal. Boa tarde para todo mundo. Vou rapidamente fazer as apresentações aqui é, dos nossos convidados. Gente, é, muitos aqui são de casa, né? Então já conhecem. Mas primeiro, Léo, nosso querido Leonardo Cruz. Obrigado por ter topado participar, viu, Léo? Eu o Léo é... moral. É, que isso. O Léo é licenciado e mestrando em História pela Universidade Federal Fluminense o único aqui entre os entrevistadores que é historiador, né? uma figura importante para a conversa de hoje. Ele faz parte do grupo de pesquisa Companhia das Índias, Núcleo de História Ibérica e Colonial na Época Moderna. E também é parte da equipe do BTCast lá com o Bibo e também parte do grupo de história da ABC2. Temos aqui o Tiago Garros, famoso Tiago Garros, uhum. magista, graduado em Biologia, pela Universidade Federal do Rio Grande do Sul, com um mestrado e doutorado pela Faculdade Este, com um período sanduíche em Oxford, lá com Alistair McGrath, e atualmente trabalha como professor no ensino básico e médio. Tiagão, muito bem-vindo. Tudo bom, pessoal? Estão me ouvindo bem aí? Está dando para 
Beleza. Uma honra estar aqui, uma honra poder conversar com o James, que eu já, opa, já conheço o livro há algum tempo e sempre quis conhecer o autor e hoje vou ter a chance aí de conversar com ele. Muito legal. Muito bom. E o, temos o privilégio de contar com o professor doutor Roberto Covolan, ex-professor da Unicamp, fez estágio de pós-doutorado na Universidade de Turim, na Itália, e também foi pesquisador visitante na Universidade de Rockefeller, Rockefeller, em New York, e na Universidade de Harvard. Ele criou o grupo de neurofísica da Unicamp e atuou na criação e gestão do BRAIN, o Brazilian Institute of Neuroscience and Neurotechnology. Ele foi presidente fundador da ABC2 e atualmente é presidente da Academia ABC2 e editor da revista Nos Mundos. Roberto, muito obrigado por estar aqui com a gente hoje. Olá, gente, um prazer estar com vocês e eu que agradeço, viu, Marcelo? E todo mundo, todo mundo mostrou o livro, eu também vou mostrar, <risos> vou mostrar a edição que eu tenho aqui, a versão que eu tenho do, do livro do Dr. Hannah. Muito bem, pessoal, então agora... Todo mundo muda a chavinha porque vamos para o inglês, ok? E finalmente, finally you have James Hannan, who received his master in historical research from Burbank College, University of London, and his PhD in history in philosophy science from Cambridge University. Currently, he's a fellow of the Royal Historical Society. He's author of the books, God's Philosophers, How the Medieval World Laid the Foundations of Modern Science, which is the same that the genesis of science, how the Christian Middle Ages launched the scientific revolution. And more recently, the globe, how the earth became round. He has also authored several book chapters and articles about science and religion. Dr. Hannon, it's such an honor to have you with us this day. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Very good. So, as the host, I have the privilege of the first question. And I used to say to our invitees that the first is the most philosophical or even Socratic question. So my question for you, Dr. Hannon, is who are you? Well, um, that's a that's an interesting question. I am um, so I'm I'm started um, off as a physicist when I first went to um, to university many many years ago, um, and then I went and worked in the city of London. I still work in the city of London, um, but I uh, when I was uh, working for maybe a few years after I had finished my my physics degree, um, I became uh, interested uh, in uh, religion, in, in, in Christianity, perhaps more than uh, I had been in, in, in the past. But because I had a physics degree, I was a little bit concerned about the way that there was supposed to be this great conflict between science and religion. So I decided I needed to, um, to read about that. That's what I... Uh, um, I like to do when I want to find out something new. And uh, I was uh, very surprised that when you are reading um, books by uh, academic authors um, like uh, David Lindbergh or, or Edward Grant um, about uh, the history of science and history of science and religion, uh, you got a very, very different picture from what you might have got from, say, Carl Sagan or Richard Dawkins. Um, and I thought, well, this is amazing because this is totally different from from what I had thought. And there's a there's a really important story to be to be told here. And so I thought, well, if I'm going to if I'm going to be the one to tell this story, I, I better go and learn some history first. And so uh, I did a uh, as you mentioned, as you kind of mentioned, um, a, a master's and a PhD um, in in history of science and. That gave me the opportunity uh, away from work for a few years to, to write the book, um, God's Philosophers, uh, which came out uh, oh, a little while ago now, 2000, 2009. 
um, and um, that was um, a book which which um, I'm was was pleased with, and it, it, it did uh, reasonably well. It's been translated in a few languages. I can hold up my my Portuguese copy of of the book. That's amazing. Yeah, and. Um, after that, uh, I went back to work, but I, I uh, remained um, very interested in, in, in these subjects um, and continued, as, as you mentioned, to, to write articles and, and, and book reviews. Um, I sort of describe myself as, as academic adjacent um, because I do things like peer reviews for journals and, and uh, the other things that academics do and, and lectures from time to time, but um, I, don't, I don't work at a, at a university. Um, and a few years ago, um, just before we we all got locked down because of of COVID, I was asked to write a book on how uh, we discovered that the Earth is round and not flat. And of course, one of the things that uh, many people wrongly believe about the Christian Church was that it taught that the world is flat, and that people in the Middle Ages were these benighted savages who all thought that if they sailed off the edge of the world, they would all fall into uh, into the abyss. Um, and I uh, used uh, some of the time perhaps that I, I had not commuting while uh, um, we, were, we were in lockdown to uh, explore that and wrote The Globe, which is not just about um, Christianity and science, but also um, covers um, how many different traditions, religions, and civilizations around the world have, have seen the world from, uh, and, and, and how they, um, in the end, all, everybody once upon a time thought that, thought that the earth was flat. They discovered that it is, in fact, um, a globe. And that was great fun because I, I got to read about, um, about uh, Chinese philosophy, Indian philosophy, Islamic philosophy, um, really being able to to branch out uh, beyond Europe because uh, there's a lot more of the world than that. That's that's very nice. It's amazing to hear about your trajectory. Thank you. So I will invite uh, Dr. Roberto. Please, can you ask your first question? Yes, yes, I think. Uh, Dr. Hannah, uh, in your book, uh, God's Philosophers, which is uh, the same one as this, the genesis of science, right? Uh, you argued that the church did not actively suppress uh, scientific progress, as a lot of people think, but uh, uh, rather it, it influenced the direction of scientific investigation. Uh, could you elaborate more on, on this point and provide some examples maybe from your book yes yeah, sure so um so during during the middle ages which is which is obviously what what um god's philosophers is is primarily about uh, the church uh, sponsored um scientific activity especially um within the universities uh, because they thought it was useful they were interested in, in science because science was a way to show that the world was an orderly uh, entity, evidence that it had been created by a, a good and loving God. And, and this provided um, apologetic backing for um, the, the Christian faith as far as the, the church was concerned. And the church was... Um, at the time, embattled by uh, various kinds of, 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 of heresies. One of the, um, the most serious, as far as it was concerned, was um, the, the Carthers in, in, in south, southern France. And they were, they were dualists. They thought that um, although heaven had been created by the good God that people worshipped, uh, earth had been created by uh, an evil god, and consequently, earth was was a, was a, was a bad place. Um, that there was um, there was nothing good about the material world, um, and and the church said, "Well, that can't be right because um, we say that the good god also created um, the earth and, and and the universe that we we live in, and science provides all this." Um, 
amazing evidence for how this world works, the orderly fashion, the law abiding fashion in which it works, the great variety of animals and plants that live in it or getting on with their lives as they're supposed to. So it couldn't possibly be the case that um, the world was created by by an evil god when it ha contains so much that, that that appears to be good and right. Um, and, and, and I think, Roberto, when, when you say that, that the church sort of steered science in, in a particular direction, that's really what, what, what I meant, is that um, it used science as um, a way to counter its critics. It found that science was, was, was useful. Um, it wasn't necessarily interested, perhaps, in a way that today scientists are uh, in, in science in its own right, just, just for, the, for the sake of it. Although there were, certainly were people working in the universities who, who did think that way. Um, so we, 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 we need to distinguish between the, the idea that there was anything like complete intellectual freedom in the Middle Ages. There certainly was not. And as we all know, unfortunately, people who um, did uh, stick to uh, beliefs which were against orthodoxy could find themselves into, in a lot of trouble. And if they were particularly obstinate, then then they would be would be burned at the stake. And, and one, you, we shouldn't lose sight of that or, or, or try to um, explain it away. Uh, but, but a lot of the stories we hear about how um, the church allegedly held back science um, uh, are, are not in fact true. We, we've, um, we've mentioned how, how they, that the church um, was, was perfectly comfortable with the idea that the earth was a globe that was just not a controversial matter um, in, in, in the late Middle Ages. Um, but there were various other things which have been suggested that the church tried to ban zero, which would have been a very odd thing for it to do, um, that, that the Pope tried to excommunicate a comet, which would have been just um, completely crazy. Um, that uh, the church was burning scientists at the stake, but it, but in fact, that there's no example that we know of of anybody um, being uh, executed for uh, strictly scientific opinions. Um, a couple of people who we, we do know of, uh, Sessio Descoli, who was an astrologer, um, and and he was um, he was burnt at the stake by the church in in Florence in the 14th century. Um, for casting the horoscope of Jesus Christ and um, declaring that um, the reason that he he was he was poor and suffered a horrible death was that he had the misfortune of being born under the wrong stars, and um, even then he had to repeat his offence before uh, suffering the ultimate penalty. And and of course, there's Giordano Bruno, who um, was a um, a 17th or he was executed in, in, in 1600 um, for his um, quite wide ranging um, ideas, which the Catholic Church found heretical um, on what today we might call um, neo paganism. Um, and again, he uh, was given um, opportunities to recant. Uh, which he wouldn't do, which is which was very brave, but unfortunately it meant that um, the church um, again decided that that he should be he should be burnt at the stake. So uh, I, I don't think it's it's right to say that um, the the intellectual freedom that we uh, enjoy today uh, in, in in science can be sort of back projected to to the Middle Ages, but. That's a very different thing from saying that the church was holding back science. I don't think it was doing that. I think it was encouraging it for its own purposes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Very good. And it's dangerous to make uh, astrological interpretations of the life of Jesus. Uh, <laughs> it's definitely something I would avoid. <laughs> Especially back then. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> good. Um, please, Leonardo, could you ask your first question? Sure. Uh, Dr. Hannon, different from my colleagues here, I'm closer to the fringe of millennials and Gen Zers, so I've been reading our books in my cell phone on Perigo. It can't show because the bright is too much, but I've been reading your most recent book, The Globe. And my first question, it's 
like a follow-up of Roberto's question, because the flat earth myth is connected to another myth that is the Middle Ages being seen as a quote-unquote dark age. And it piques my curiosity because this myth is not used only by uh, secular criticism of Christianity, but also as a Protestant myself, I see Protestant colleagues who are very uh, anti-Catholics anti using this myth to diminish the importance of uh, Catholic institutions towards uh, directing science. So my question is, it's two questions in one. How do the most recent research findings correct this myth of the medieval, medieval age, Middle Ages, sorry, as a dark age? And how do they illuminate the usage of the same myth by two groups that are so antagonistic? I mean, one secularist and another so deeply religious. Well, uh, recent research, um, by which I mean in, 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 in the last few decades, um, has uncovered um, a lot of things which really, I suppose, we, we, we always knew, but we didn't really think about in the right in the right sort of way about um, important progress that that took place during the Middle Ages, from from the early Middle Ages where um, the the stirrup was was introduced from the steps, the the iron plow um, was introduced, um, which enabled um, the cultivation of Northern Europe to go ahead much more efficiently than it had been able to do um, in in the Roman Empire. Um, the horse collar. Uh, which meant that a horse could be used as a more effective and faster beast of burden than the traditional oxen. Um, and then we move on uh, um, a little bit further. We, we find uh, that, that later in the Middle Ages, there were, there were all sorts of inventions, which I think we think of as being quite modern. Um, for example, um, spectacles, which uh, some of us are, are wearing, that um, they were um, invented um, in Italy. Um, possibly in 13th, 14th century. We're not exactly sure who, who should get credit for that invention, and that's often the case. We can't sort of put, put a name to it. There are various um, people who've been, who've been suggested. Um, but we do know um, that um, by the 14th century, um, literate people were using glasses to, to read so they could extend their um, their, their lives of, of, of scholarship because um, that's, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm beginning to suffer from as you get older you you're, it becomes harder to to um, to read and see things which which are close to you and um, the, the the first thing that spectacles were used for was was to, was to correct for that so people who were um, getting into their 40s or 50s were able to to continue reading and obviously you've you've still got there for them being able to re lead full um, academic lives. Um, another thing uh, that was uh, invented around that time was the mechanical clock, uh, very possibly um, invented in, in East England, although that again is not something we can be um, entirely sure of. Um, and the mechanical clock uh, was uh, obviously a, a way of telling the time, but, but it had a much more profound effect than that. It really altered the way that time um, was 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 measured and and, and experienced because um, before the mechanical clock, um, the length of an hour was dependent on how long it was daylight and night. So the length of an hour changed um, during the course of of the year. Mechanical clocks don't work like that. They work with every hour being the same, and that was why we ended up with um, the regular hours and regular timekeeping that. That we have today, um, so I think it it was a, a very important step for towards modernity, um, and then uh, although printing um, was um, you know we traditionally associate it with 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 Gutenberg in in um, the the fourteen fifties, uh, block printing was being used in Europe um, before that time, and the Europeans were very open to. Um, inventions that have that actually been made in other parts of the world but uh, they were open-minded people they saw something that looked like it was it was a good idea they they were quite happy to adopt it um and uh, gunpowder is a, is a classic example that came from from china um the magnetic compass 
um, was uh, was used for navigation in Europe sometime after it had first been used in China. But the, the Europeans, obviously, they they would use the the compass to um, find their way across uncharted oceans and eventually um, across the across the Atlantic. Um, paper, uh, paper is is actually something that didn't arrive in Europe until the 13th century, um, but it uh, it revolutionised the book industry. Because prior to that, they had had to use um, to use vellum parchment, which is made from animal skins and and much much more expensive than than paper, which can be made from wood pulp or from um, from uh, old clothes. So again, these these kinds of um, inventions were were pushing uh, the European Middle Ages really quite rapidly to towards um, what we call the the, the modern period. And 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 the, the the question of where the 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 myth of the Dark Ages comes from, I think, is it is is an interesting one. And um, one of the people who, at least in England, we we tend to pin quite a lot of the blame on was, was Francis Bacon. Uh, he was uh, the the uh, the Lord Chancellor of England in the early seventeenth century, uh, and was also um, probably best known today. Uh, for his writings on um, on science and, and and philosophy and and how to increase knowledge, uh, and although he he died before um, that really came to fruition with with the creation of the Royal Society about about fifty years later, where they, he he was then lauded as this great prophet of of, of modernity. Um, but he was a, he was a Protestant, and he did he didn't like Catholics at all, which was not uncommon with English people in those days. Um, and he very definitely pointed to the Catholic Church as being something that was um, holding progress back. He very much believed in progress. He believed um, that what humans um, needed to do was was to return to. Um, the perfect knowledge that that Adam had had in the Garden of Eden before before the fall, when um, he had stopped being able to perceive um, things clearly. So, uh, and Bacon is the earliest uh, source I've been able to find of somebody saying that people in the Middle Ages thought the Earth was flat, and uh, uh, that particular calumny, of course, has, has uh, continued uh, probably right up to this day. And and um, that that came earlier than than, than the uh, um, the the atheist critique of the Middle Ages, which which dates from from the period we call, we call the Enlightenment, the sort of the late eighteenth nineteenth century. Um, and in the nineteenth century, there were some very big fat books written by um, American scholars, Andrew Dixon White being one, John William Draper being being another, both both sort of famous figures. Um, where they they wrote in great detail about how um, the science had been had been held back by religion and Catholicism in particular, uh, but when you go back through their work, you look at the evidence, you follow it back to the sources, you do find there's an awful lot of what they were saying. If 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 it wasn't being made up, was certainly being quite seriously misinterpreted by them. It's very good, very good. Thank you, Dr. Hannon. Good overview of all this literature. Um, now, Chago, please, could you ask your first question? Yeah, sure. I was gonna ask something uh, uh, similar along the lines of Professor Roberto, but I think he already answered. Uh, I, I would just add up uh, to going back to your first answer that it, you, you use the expression um, creative tension to actually define the relationship of science and religion in the Middle Ages. And I think you unpacked a little bit uh, on your first answer to that. So I'm going to move to my second question that I prepared here, which is regarding the, the term, the, the, the whole debate about the scientific revolution. Uh, so you make clear in the conclusion of your, uh, of God's philosophers, uh, that the term scientific revolution makes us overlook the importance of the of the scientific advances that you just described some of them here uh, of the Middle Ages, and it and it the idea reinforces uh, the idea that uh, before Copernicus nothing really important ever actually happened. Uh, 
which your book shows us that it's not true, right? However, we are always taught by the likes of Peter Harrison, John Brooke, and all these big names that, that we all read and like, uh, that a bigger emphasis in the empirical method of investigation, after, especially after the Reformation, um, uh, with Francis Bacon and, and the likes, uh, and often we hear quotes to back this up, right? Uh, like, for example, from Robert Hooke, that, mm -hmm. that famous quote that he says, uh, uh, that the remedy for the vices of human reasons are the real, are, it's by doing real empirical philosophy. So isn't, isn't that uh, a change of approach that is, would be sufficient enough to call it a, a scientific revolution? Because I can tell you, you are one of those that don't like the term. But isn't this change of approach that we hear from these names, usually backed up by these types of quotes, isn't this enough to, sh to talk about a, a real scientific revolution? How would you Dr. Hannan, respond? May I just add up one, one related, very similar question? I think it's part of the same package uh, that in Thiago. So, um, looking at the literature on the history of science religion, as I see it, we have on one side the figures like Edward Grant, who would say something like that. Uh, the scientific revolution was nothing but the development of the foundations that were laid during the Middle Ages. There was no rupture. On the other hand, as Thiago said, Peter Harrison and maybe Stephen Galkroger, while analogizing the importance of the Middle Ages would say that something fundamental for the scientific, scientific revolution was brought up by the Protestant Reformation. So how do you see this debate? I, I think that's the question of Thiago. Uh, and, and how do you see yourself within this debate? Well, it still is a debate, and it's still a, it's still a debate within my head, um, not to mention... Um, uh, between between other um, other other people, I think something really significant did happen in the 17th century, uh, because there really isn't very much that we would describe as experimental in the Middle Ages, and 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 I I, I noted that in um, in in God, in God's philosophers that um, for example that the Latin word that we was used to uh, describe experiments um, in in the 17th century um, was was a word that was probably better translated as experience during the Middle Ages, and that when when that word, which was um, uh, experimentia, was is, is used in a medieval source, so some people are saying, "Ah, they're doing experiments," but actually, all they're doing is they're saying, "We've seen this." We've experienced this. We're not talking at all about controlled experiments of the sort that, that a hook or a boil um, might be doing. Um, but I think that, uh, so I, th I think something very significant did happen in the 17th century, but I, I think it didn't, uh, it didn't start or finish in the 17th century. I think if, I, th I think if you want to, um, tell that story and not begin at the middle, you do have to go back into the Middle Ages and you do have to continue that story really right the way up until about 1900. Because I think that a lot of what we associate with, with science, with modern science, took quite a long time to, to unravel. Um, so it wasn't as if science was born fully formed from the mind of Sir Isaac Newton in the in the late um, in the late seventeenth century. What I what I would say, and I, I, this is this perhaps goes a little bit beyond what I, I um, noted in God's Philosophers, is that what I think all kinds of pre-modern science have in common is that they have this. Um, almost ethical dimension. People 
uh, were using science, not, as I said um, earlier, to try to um, understand the world for its own sake, but to understand the meaning of the world, to understand the purpose of the world, and sometimes to understand how, how the world ought to be. And they were more interested in how the world ought to be um, than how it actually was. And if you had a particular religious or ethical grounding, you were a, a Christian or a Platonist or, or um, a, a Muslim or, or Confucian over in China, the way that you saw the world and the science you did was really heavily colored by that background. Um, and I think what happened in the 17th century was that science became less ethical. And the question of whether a particular scientific theory was right or wrong stopped being decided by how well that scientific theory coheres with my philosophical belief on something, on ethics, um, and started being answered by, well, how, long, how well does this scientific theory correspond to the way that reality actually is? And the mystery of the scientific revolution, if we want to call it that, to me, is why did that change? Because people didn't become less religious in the 17th century. I mean, they may have become Catholic or Protestant, but they were all still pretty devout people. Um, and people like Boyle and Newton, they were super devout. So why was it that this, this change of emphasis happened? And that's something that I don't think has ever really been properly answered because most of the answers I hear well people freed their minds they became more rational the church not telling them what to do uh, it's just just doesn't seem to actually um, explain the evidence terribly well so that that's probably where I'm at at the moment on the question of the scientific revolution and, and when and, and if it happened Very good. This is indeed a big question. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Um, Roberto, now you can ask your second question, please. Okay. Uh, um, uh, Dr. Hannah, uh, uh, coming back to your book, The Globe, How the Earth Became Around. Uh, okay, uh, the acceptance of this uh, concept uh, during history, uh, I think, uh, had to, to face a recur a recurring challenges. And uh, uh, I'm supposing that uh, uh, that happened. And uh, my question is, if you see an, any connection of these challenges with the recent uh, uh, flat earth movement we see around and uh, w why the reasons uh, I mean behind this sort of movement what was your, your opinion about that well I, th I think that for a long time it was perfectly sensible and perfectly rational to assume the earth is flat because well, it just is I mean it's obvious you look out the window I mean you, we're not falling off it, it's just there's, there's so many difficult questions that have to be answered to explain why it's possible for the Earth to be a globe. And over the course of two and a half thousand years since, since uh, the, the, uh, the Greek philosophers um, came up with the idea sometime in uh, uh, probably the early early fourth century BC, we've answered those questions and we, we've, we've gathered the evidence together and so that it, it's no longer sensible to believe that the the earth is flat. So I think that um, the the people today who who are flat earthers are not in the same boat as um, someone in China a thousand years ago, where you had a sophisticated society uh, with its own uh, important scientific and astronomical traditions, which assumed that the earth was flat. That's what everybody in China bar a few Muslim immigrants thought. So I don't really see that there's, there's, it, it's fair to compare those people to the flat earthers today who have decided 
that they're going to disregard those answers. And I suspect that the reason that they are disregarding them is that they have a, a basic disregard for, um, for authority, for knowledge, uh, as it is is taught to them, they 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 can't perhaps distinguish um, between uh, being sceptical of authority, which is a good thing, uh, and simply rejecting it out of hand, which is a bad thing because there are lots of people who are um, more knowledgeable us than us, and 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 um, it pays listening to those to those people. So. Uh, I, th I think the motivations for today's flat Earth is very different from from what they were for people in the past before it became something which I think we we are able to to, to prove. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe today the movement has more a more ideological or even political motivations than a thousand years ago. Maybe something along these lines. I, I think I think that's right. I, th I think I think there is a strong ideological view and there's a strong ideological view for um other people who um reject particular aspects of of science now i'm i'm uh, very um uh, conventional in my, my my scientific beliefs but um so i i i always worry a little bit that i may be offending somebody if i say that i think such and such is right and it definitely is right but you can think of you can think of examples across the political spectrum where the scientific consensus is being rejected by people. The left-wing people, uh, some left-wing people um, reject the, the scientific consensus, for example, that there are two sexes and uh, you can't move from one to the other, even if you choose to identify that way. Um, other people on the right, they will uh, reject the, um, the, the, the consensus science on, say, climate change. And again, um, you 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 have to suspect that there are there are political or indeed ethical um, matters uh, at work here, and perhaps perhaps the people who who do reject um, particular um, aspects of of the modern scientific consensus, um, perhaps they do actually have something in common with. Uh, pre-modern science because we were just talking earlier about how I think there's a very strong ethical and ideological dimension to pre-modern science and maybe that's that's showing that's showing through uh, today in people who um, don't accept particular um, scientific discoveries. So I appreciate that's all, all a little bit controversial. That's a very good point. It resonates with my own research of the relation between ethics and epistemology. They are not as separate as some people suppose them to be. Well, thank you. Um, Leonardo, please, you can ask now your second question. Thank you. Uh, it happens to be another follow-up to Roberto's question. I mean, I, I didn't mean to exclude Tiago, but it seems like Roberto and I are doing a great teamwork here without even planning this, because I'll keep going on the Flat Earth book, and we have been discussing the reasons why there are so many denialisms through the political spectrum. We, we talked about uh, rejection of authority and ideological motivations. But what I want to ans answer, sorry, or want to question is through your wide research, because you dealt with a huge scope of documentation for this book, and congratulations, it's a huge work. Uh, what did you see concerning the mechanisms of denialism? I mean, not the reasons, but what does it look like to deny such a huge scope of evidence? Well, I think I think uh, you, you, Marcelo mentioned um, mentioned epistemology, and um, when 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 philosophers talk about what is true, they most often, at least in the English speaking philosophical tradition, they talk about um, something is true if it corresponds to reality and uh, we would therefore be very skeptical of someone who believed something that we don't think corresponds to reality or we might think we are but but that definition of truth i think is not the way that human beings generally 
accept whether something is true or false. I think that people tend to believe something is true if it coheres with everything else that they think is true. And if they think that various things are true that we might think are false, they're going to believe other things we think are false because that will all cohere, cohere into what they consider to be a coherent worldview. Uh, so I see a lot of um, people believing things which, which maybe I would I would um, I would disagree of them them doing so, and I think I probably do the same because those things are um, logically coherent with 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 the rest of 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 my worldview um, and at a most basic level for instance if you if you believe that um if you believe that god exists um you will accept perhaps a category of of propositions that an atheist will not accept because they're an atheist and um so I, when people deny things i think they are perhaps to put a slightly more positive gloss on it, they are accepting things which um, cause them to be able to keep their, their worldview together because they, they, they can continue to be, in our own minds, logical, rational and coherent. It's very, very difficult to hold two conflicting thoughts in your head. Thank you. Thank you for him. Uh, Thiago, please. Yeah, um, I have to go in about nine minutes because I need to go back to my my students who are waiting for me. <laughs> so uh, let me ask a question that is very different from from this topic, <clears throat> and it is related to to the 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 expansion of science uh, and the thing that we that we always uh, hear when we hear about the scientific revolution, if it exists or not, uh, we all know that, and we are used to say that science started, uh, science as a movement that changed the world, that, that uh, science as, a, as an endeavor that really Cause uh, the 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 mo cause modernity. We always hear that it started in Europe, in the Christian Europe, and then we have Peter Harris and all these people giving us the reasons of of why is it like that or why it happened like that. Um, but then when we talk about this with uh, let let me give you the example of my history teachers here in school. They're gonna say that that happened because of the colonizing project, because there was science, science before, we all know, but they are gonna promptly associate with these movements that are happening right now of decolonization and talking about post-colonial uh, science, science and post-colonial studies. And they're gonna be very quick to say that if it wasn't for the expansionist colonial project, mm -hmm all these other sciences that emerged on the Mayans and Incas and Africa and China and these other places would have picked up speed. And it was basically what they're saying is that Christianity with their colonial project is what killed the science and it's all colonialism. How, I, I more or less know the answers, but my question to you would be, how would you start explaining to somebody who claims that that the thing is a bit more complicated than that. <laughs> well, I, I think you, you mentioned China, and I think China is is, is a really good counter example here, uh, because in the in the early fifteenth century, China was bigger, more populous, richer, more technologically advanced than Europe was. Um, but it. And part of part of part, part of the the effect of that was um, quite famously uh, the the Ming Dynasty sent out this massive fleet of uh, of of junks, enormous ships, much much bigger than anything that was being built in in Europe at the time, and they sailed around the the Indian Ocean on several trips, and they picked up 
um, tribute from all the various people that that, that they met. And um, as far as the emperor of China is concerned, he ruled the world. He ruled all under heaven. Uh, it's just that some of these people didn't know it yet. <laughs> and his his uh, aims in sending out the, these fleets was really what we would call colonialism and, under, and any other um, label because uh, there were tri Chinese merchants were, were settling all the way around the, the, the Indian Ocean. They were um, collecting all these gifts and treasure and taking them all back to, to China. Um, so I, I think that uh, if what we were, what you were describing um, as, as, as European colonialism was what started the scientific um, revolution, it would have started in China at least 100 years before, if not more than 100 years before. And it, it's very, very difficult to uh, explain if you're just using those sorts of um, socio-economic arguments to, to explain what happened and what the difference is and why Europe caught up with China and caught up with the Arab world, because, of course, the Arab world was also more advanced than, than Europe for several centuries um, during, during the Middle Ages. And um, Islam spread right the way across Asia and large amounts of, 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 um, of Africa. So it, it's, it, I, think, I think it is the case that um, the discoveries of the Americas were, were um, part of the story People found that the world was was different from what they thought it, it looked like. They discovered all these new animals and plants that, that um, uh, they they previously had 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 no knowledge of. Um, they were able to set up trade routes, uh, which made Europe richer. And I'm sure that Europe being richer was also helpful as far as the development of, of, of science was concerned. But it's by no means the um, the whole story. And if it was the whole story, uh, I don't think it would have been Europe that got there first. Very, very good. Thiago, thank you very much for, for sharing our conversation. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to have to go. <laughs> I'm yeah, sorry. Great I to would, meet you. I would love to stay until the end, but I'm in the middle of my work day here. So I hope you, you guys okay. have a good one. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you. Uh, Roberto, now we have a, a little of time for a final quick question. Would you like to ask your final question, please? Okay. Um... Let me bring the, the discussion discussion to the to nowadays uh, uh, questions, and uh, we are from a, a uh, organization called uh, Brazilian Association of Christians and Science, and our main aim is to promote the dialogue between uh, faith and science fields, and and there is this uh, ongoing and, and never finishing debate of. Uh, the role of religion in, in scientific education, education in general, and particularly in, in scientific education. So, uh, I'd like to to ask you about your your perspective on how uh, religions, beliefs, and science principles would relate with each other in, in educational uh, contexts. Uh, should it be uh, intersect or should it be kept separate? What were your view on this subject? Well, I think it's it's true that certainly in the UK there isn't a huge amount of religious education left, to be honest. And uh, that that there is, and my, my, my son is just doing his um, his GCSEs at the moment, his exams at, at the age of 16. Um, and he has, in, in, in the course of that, had to um, study three or four different religions, and each of those religions has a different kind of relationship with with science. Um, so I think that I I would keep I would keep science and religion pretty much separate as far to, as far as the school syllabus is concerned. I I would be very uh, I would certainly be encouraging students to to debate these matters and and and, and talk about these matters, especially the you know the, the kind of context that, that we've been talking in um, today. But um, 
I think at school we 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 have so much um, knowledge that we're we're trying to sort of pump into our children nowadays, and there are so many things that they are supposed to know um, that uh, there, there really isn't all that much um, space to start having the debates because you need to have all the facts and, and all the knowledge before you can really have have that that debate and and that discussion so uh i think i probably would keep them separate educationally and and i think i would probably wait and uh until uh university before people are will know enough to be able to um have uh, intelligent conversations about the sorts of issues that, that uh, um, Christians and science are interested in. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Leo, do you have a, a final quick question, please? I think the question may be quick, but I don't know about the answer. The <laughs> logical question. Uh, That's okay. I, I myself am a, a graduate student, and I research religious phenomena, not in natural sciences, but history of economic thought, and. I have my own take on this question, but I'd like to hear from you a more experienced, experienced researcher, which is uh, reading the historiography. I often read things like some people trying to belittle the religious influences in historical events. And on the other hand, some other people exaggerating this for their own means, their own ends, sorry. It's better to say that by their own ends. So how do you deal with this tendency not and avoid instrumentalizing history or your object of research so you cannot undermine the, the forces of religion on the topic or not exaggerating them to show religions, religion is important. It's very, it's very difficult to be objective, isn't it? And um, I think that... Um, I I like to think, and I I think I do think actually that that if I was an atheist, I'm not an atheist, but if I was an atheist, I would have written the same books and would have come to the same conclusions. I can't know that for sure, but I think that's 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 what I I think. And when and when you know, as as as, as a non atheist, I'm I, I I'm feeling you know doubtful about um, about religion, about God, that doesn't change how I think about the history that I've, I've, I've studied. So um, but I can't I can't really speak for for other 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 writers. They may know things that that that, that I do not and my 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 area, you know, the history of science is it's quite a narrow one um, compared to, um, uh, you know, history as 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 a whole. So um, I'm not really sure quite how I can answer your answer your question to which way one might go. Um, what what do you think? This is why I said the question was quick. The answer I didn't. <laughs> So, so from my from my own point of view, I, I think that uh, avoiding the 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 more universalizing conclusions is the best way. Yeah, uh, you, you said your topic is a narrow topic. My one is as well history of economic thought. But I was talking to Marcel before you 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 entered our our program. Uh, we can see as. Uh, let me see. Let me take a pause because the first time I'm talking about this in English. Religion is on the background of almost everything in early modern Europe and medieval ages, even more, I can say. Uh, so when you think about economics, uh, think about, uh, let's say, as an economic system like capitalism. We can only think economics as a system because we had a huge influence of natural theology, which is the world as a huge system of laws which one counterforces the other, and commerce is in the middle of this, but also morals, also uh, aesthetics, and everything else. And someone more religious like myself could say, see, modern economics is a Christian uh, 
uh, the Christian endeavor without Christianity wouldn't have this. But as long as we keep researching, for example, the, the Scottish Enlightenment, Adam Smith, Ferguson, all the guys, they did this because they had a huge influence on natural theology. Some of them were Christians themselves, but they were also very influenced by Stoicism, which has very similar views of natural theology. So it's, it is entirely Christian or not. We can say about more technical issues like Without Arab numbers, we wouldn't have modern book keep, bookkeeping, which was a Franciscan invention, taking a, a, an instrument from Muslim people, and then without all of this, we wouldn't have a system of bookkeeping, which would, would, which would foster a capitalist system. So it, it's a very complex network of things, and religion is on is in the background of everything. But we need to measure the the relative force of each case we are studying because uh, the more technical issues we are uh, we are dealing with technology or the more ideological religion will have a different uh, uh, relative weight to all these questions so that's yeah. how I, I, I see the issue have you have you um have you read um tom holland yes i've i've read him dominion he i uh, that that I think he he's he's the he's very much as you as you you know of, of the opinion that Christianity is behind everything in West in Western civilization. Yeah. And even people who who don't think they're at all Christian are like a hundred percent influenced by 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 Christianity. I'm not quite sure. Um I follow him all the way, but I do I do I do see that that he he has a point. I, I would say he, he's correct, but the, the amount of correctness depends on the matter. <laughs> yeah, that, that's right. That's right. Very, very good debate. I, I've been reading this book. Do the humanities create knowledge? And uh, it tries to provide a big answer for this very different discipline that comprises the humanities. But it's interesting uh, in your debate right now that he, he says that. Scholarly knowledge has all to do with salience. So when I see our debate in history, you know, we know that all these things have a huge influence, religion, structures, but the the weight of each thing is the great question, right? How big was the influence? Uh, which was the biggest? That's the, the great question. Uh, Thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Hanna, I have a quick question to end our conversation. Usually in our interviews, I end our interview by asking some kind of personal, but also fun questions, if you don't mind. Uh, so uh, could you share with us a book or an author that you really like, but it's important, it cannot be a book of a scholarly book. It cannot be a book of history, of theology, of philosophy. It can be a literature or poetry, but a, a book that has a personal meaning that you enjoyed. Um, I, I have to admit, um, I don't. Um, I don't tend to read very much fiction. I just don't have 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 the time. Um, but uh, I think a book that I've really enjoyed, which which isn't to do with what I what I study, <laughs> which, which I I've I've read recently, which is not um, which is not fiction, uh, is uh, by by David Reich, uh, who we are and where we came from, which is about the new uh, the new subject of genetic history and how we have been learning about. Uh, the way that humanity spread across the globe um, as a result of being able to extract DNA from ancient bones and um, to, to sequence that and to, to show that uh, populations came from particular places and, and, and how they moved and, and how uh, the, the variety of ancient humanity was 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 much wider than we we previously had had believed. Um, so um, that's that's a book which I, I I really enjoyed and really did sort of change perhaps the way I 
I saw um, the ancient world. I'm curious now about this book. Thank you. Uh, Roberto, would you like to? No, no, uh, 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 which is the book again? Uh, it's, uh, let me go and get it, hang on. Who we are and how we got here by David Wright. Wow. Okay. This o Oxford University. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, thank you very much, Dr. James Hannon, for your time, for very kind and thoughtful answers. Thank you for uh, spending your time with us. Uh, thank you, Roberto, Leo, for bringing very good questions for our table. Okay, thank you. And thank you very, very much for having me. It's been, it's been, it's been great to talk to you um, today. So uh, I do, uh, I always enjoy having a chance to chat through my, my work with uh, um, people who are, uh, are interested. So thank you again. Okay. Bye bye. Pessoal, então a gente fica por aqui. Essa foi mais uma entrevista da Entre Mundos, o nosso canal da revista Unos Mundos. Lembrem de seguir as nossas postagens e aqui o nosso canal no YouTube. Um grande abraço para todos. Tchau, tchau. Bye.